The reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 to 10. And I'm sorry, my Farsi is not good enough to do it in Farsi as well. Isaiah chapter 35, reading the whole chapter. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Lovely to see you on this cold winter morning. I'm Ken Wong, for those who have not met me yet, I'm a member of this church. Have you felt afraid? Anxious? Maybe about the future? Poor health? Rising bills? Cost of few energy supply, strikes, well-being of friends and families, especially if they live very far away. Christian hope and joy is not dependent on happy circumstances. Amen. Isaiah tells us, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Amen to that. Are you going through a desert, I wonder? Are you thirsty? Please turn with me to the Bible. Isaiah chapter 35. Verse 1 reads, The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like a crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. To understand this passage better, let's briefly review the context. Judah and Israel were taught Yahweh their God was the creator of the universe, Lord of history. They believed they were chosen by God. 
But some events shocked their understanding. Around 722 BC, Assyria defeated Israel and it went into exile. How could Yahweh be Lord if oppressors were forcing his people to bow down to them? About 20 years later, Assyria was threatening Jerusalem, the capital of Judah too. Can you imagine God's people must be asking, why? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. The first two verses gives us a clue. The word that really springs out at me is rebel. They've rebelled against me. Rebellion against God is what Christians call sin. It's refusing to treat God as God, our maker, our loving father. Fundamental to all the divine deliverance in the book of Isaiah is this five letter word, trust, trust in God. That's a central theme to chapters seven to 39. People from Judah were tempted to trust other nations, other people, to deliver them. Isaiah tried to show them that only Yahweh is God. Anything or anybody else they trust in, place of God, will fail them. However, if they wait for God, God will deliver them. And God tr- shows he is truly trustworthy when Hezekiah, in chapter 36 and 7, really trusts God. Against all odds, a huge Assyrian army that defies that trust, Hezekiah decides he's putting his trust in God. And Isaiah prophesied, God will deliver Jerusalem. And do you know what happens? Look at chapter 37. 185,000 in the Assyrian camp died. The, Isaiah said, the angel of the Lord put them to death. And God delivered Judah. Now, in the midst of all this exciting narrative, in our passage today, it's written in the style of a poem, but full of prophetic promises. And it highlights the results, the blessings of trust. So, verse 2. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Let me briefly explain to you what, what, what on earth these three places are. Chapter 33 talks about broken covenants. Now, Lebanon used to be really famous for great cedar forests. It withered away. Sharon was a fruitful plain. It's like a desert. Carmel was a grazing land, and its leaves were shaken off. First two here, can you now see why such a message of hope? The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. How? Remember last week, Jess reminded us God brings new life from a dead place. In Isaiah 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's King David's dad. And of course, Jesus was that shoot. And we all know it's the Holy Spirit that gives life. Isaiah 32 says, the Spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful land. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you send us your Holy Spirit now. Fill us, Lord. Give us life. Help us to enjoy you and be filled with the joy of the redeemed. Amen. Amen. All humans have chosen to trust humanity instead of God. And so we plunge ourselves into a desert. 
But God doesn't want to leave us in a departed land. Instead, he wants to transform this desert into a fertile land, into a place of joy. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will be a place where the glory of the Lord is seen again. Verse 3, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God, God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Did you see there? God is glorious because he's a righteous judge. He doesn't leave sin unpunished. God will, will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. But the good news is God is glorious also because he will come to save. Now, we'll come back to how he does that in a moment, but for now, can we just hold these two glorious truths of our God in tension? His justice and love. I promise there will be a resolution of that tension in a moment. But for now, let's just trust God's promise. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, he will come to save you. Now, then comes a most miraculous promise in verse 5. Then would the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then would the lame leap like a deer and a mute tongue shout for joy. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? Yes, amen. 700 years later, let's turn to an eyewitness account in Matthew chapter 15. Of course, Matthew was one of the 12 disciples. Great crowds came to Jesus, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed. When they saw the mute speak, the crippled made well, the lame walking and blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Matthew made it clear that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 35. As if that's not clear enough, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Verse 1, when John the Baptist was in prison, he, he heard about all these deeds of the Messiah, and he sent his disciples to ask him. Do you know what John asked? Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else what did Jesus reply go back and report to John what you hear and see the blind receiving sight the lame walk those who have leprosy are cleansed the deaf hear the dead are raised and the good news is proclaimed to the poor Jesus himself produced the evidence that he was the Messiah, the Savior. So back to Isaiah 35. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. Oh, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, are you thirsty for more? Do you remember Jesus telling this Samaritan woman who tried to fill her life with relationships that didn't quite satisfy? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Isaiah 35 verse eight, I love this verse. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Isaiah reminds us, the unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools won't go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. In other words, it's a safe way. But you may be thinking, yes, yes, I want to walk on that way. I want to walk on a safe way. But I've sinned too. I've rebelled against God. Now, the fact that you're humble enough to realize you do not deserve to be on that highway, on that safe way, means there's good news for you. I'll be worried if you think you've never sinned. I'll have bad news for you then. But the fact that you know that you have rebelled against God and have sinned means there's good news. Because what does Isaiah say? Only those who have done more good than bad will walk there? No, he didn't say that. He said, but only the redeemed will walk there. Verse 10, and those the Lord has rescued will return. Remember Romans, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus died and took the punishment of our sins. The Son of God, the eternal Son of God, took all our punishment for all our rebellions, my rebellion, your rebellion, past, present and future, on himself, on that cross. So we won't get punished again. He himself, Jesus said, God so loves the world that he gave his only son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. They will enter Zion with singing, Isaiah said. Everlasting joy with crown. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Now, Zion is Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah. We are promised a new Jerusalem. The Apostle John wrote in Revelation, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Do you have a hope that helps you through difficult, challenging circumstances? Do you have a hope that gives you joy through all the suffering challenges in life? A Christian cancer specialist shared this testimony of her patient experiencing Christian hope and joy. He was reading an email on scripture. Hint, hint. Make the most of Christmas. Send lots of Christmas cards. Write scripture on it. Send emails. You never know what seed you're sowing. Anyway, this guy was an atheist. He was reading an email on scripture. He wrote, I was in a relaxed, contemplative state. And upon reading really focus on the words and their meaning. It was then I felt the Holy Spirit, the comforting, enveloping warmth, tingling and altered perception. Blissful and peaceful, it almost made me laugh as it came to me. It felt like my eyes had been opened. It was a moment when I felt I touched on something intangible, almost imperceptible, just out of normal reach, a frequency I was able to tune into momentarily. Felt like I was plugged in and I need to get back there. It was within this, I became aware all my questions didn't matter and I didn't need to understand everything. I wouldn't be able to understand anyway. For example, what happens to people killed prematurely before they have chance to find God? He said, now, I had been a staunch atheist, but I knew on the start of my spiritual awakening, one thing was unrefutable. 
Christian faith had saved me. Many things had happened before meeting my oncologist that's a cancer specialist. Through my wife's action and prayer, his, his wife was a Christian, is a Christian. But when I met her, she told me, technically, I was too far gone to help with God. Uh, sorry, technically, this is what a cancer specialist was telling him. I was too far gone to help, but God had told her to treat me. Now, whether God's real or not, I knew that woman's decision, influenced by faith, had saved me. This woman of science had felt God's presence and sprang into action, arranging for me what would turn out to be life-saving treatment. He said, when I lay there in the middle of the night in pain, contemplating the end, staring into the abyss, it felt very sad. I didn't want to go. All this was unexpected and not the way I'd imagined the end of my life. And I certainly didn't want to say goodbye. My family depend on me and I love them dearly. The thought of leaving them was unbearable and my heart was breaking. In my darkest hour, Richard Dawkins couldn't save me. There was only one that could. So I pleaded with him to be saved. Not fully expecting an answer, but he did, and in spades. Anxiety and despair has been replaced with love and hope. To what is one of the best times of my life? I no longer fear death. If it's God's will I should pass, then onwards and upwards in his glory, to be at peace with God. The hard part is saying goodbye to my wife and children. But as I like to remind myself, it's not a final goodbye. But just see you later, as I'm just going on ahead. It is not an exclusive club. Anyone can join. All you need to do is to reach out your hand to Jesus. This man's Christian cancer specialist thought he was too unwell to treat, expecting him to live less than a few weeks. But he miraculously survived 18 months. He became a Christian and experienced joy of the redeemed. Do you want to know that joy even in face of suffering and death? In a moment, we'll sing together with joy of the redeemed. But for now, let's still our hearts and minds in the presence of God. Please close your eyes and meditate on those truths that Isaiah's poem in chapter 35 revealed to us. If you would like to trust God, trust Jesus as your personal saviour. If you want to experience that joy for the first time, or to experience that joy again after a period of time when the joy, the presence of the Lord has been crowded out of your life because of fears or worries or maybe simply being too busy, would you stand up or raise your hand up? I'd love to say a special prayer for you. And I want to extend this offer to friends, brothers and sisters listening to this recording of the sermon. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you because you are glorious, you are righteous, and you are also merciful and loving. Thank you so much for sending your dear son Jesus to die in our place on the cross, to take that punishment on himself so we can experience the joy of the redeemed. 
Oh, Holy Spirit, we pray you fill us every day like you have today. Come, Lord. We want more of you. We want more of your fruit, Lord, your love, your joy, your peace, your patience. And may this love and this joy spill over to everyone we meet this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.